Okay, let's get started. We're talking today about UPL. All right, great. <laughs> um, UPL is a um, project that I started uh, maybe six months ago um, as a proof of concept for what um, changes we might want to make in um, Drupal Core uh, for Drupal 8 for testing. Okay. Um, the test framework? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, clever. Um, yes. <laughs> Pretty good. Um, okay. So, on the left hand side here, we have our current um, simple test framework and specifically the flow that it does in order to run its tests, okay? Um, this is the simple test module, is um, the, the test runner, at least that's what I like to think of it as, okay? Um, and it goes through and finds all of the test cases um, and runs a setup method. Um, the setup method sets up a whole new Drupal, okay? Um, usually sets up a whole new Drupal and the test methods run inside of this child Drupal, okay? Um, after that, uh, there's a teardown and you know, rinse and repeat until all of the specified classes are tested, all right? Um, on the right-hand side, you have a simpler um, flow for testing, which is to say that you run the, co the command line PHP unit program, um, that's another open source project for people who don't know, super popular in the PHP community as a test runner, okay? Um, that discovers all of the test classes that are in the directory you've pointed to or otherwise fed it. Um, and those test classes are then run against your Drupal instance. So the SUT here stands for system under test, all right? So, one of the key advantages of UPL um, is to get rid of what I think is a fatal confusion inside of the current simple test system, which is that there are two different Drupals going on when you're running your simple test, okay? There is the host Drupal, which you are logged into, you have administer simple test permissions, okay? You click a button in the web GUI and uh, it goes ahead and runs your tests, right? Um, <clears throat> then there's the system under test, which simple test basically um, builds up an environment for you and runs tests in there. And simple test does Herculean efforts to make sure that there's no leakage between the um, host Drupal and the system under test. Um, but if you've been watching the issue queues for the last few years, um, we continue to struggle with that leakage, okay? Um, and so the model on the right hand side, there is only one Drupal. There is no host or system under test and confusion and leakage. There is just Drupal, that's what's getting tested, and there's PHP unit. And there can be no confusion about, you know, I'm actually in the test, but I'm, I've already loaded a file and PHP is getting confused between the two Drupals. No, there's only one Drupal, all right? so. Um, I think that's a really strong improvement. You know, for the folks out there who've tried to debug simple test, this is one of the things that's absolutely killer is that there's two different Drupals. Um, in fact, when you're inside a test, sometimes there's like more layers of confusion. There's requests that are calling back in a Drupal, but uh, for now, um, we're going from two Drupals to one, okay? Um, so I, I've already started talking about uh, some of the advantages that I think the UPL system gives us, okay? Um, skipping down to the, the third bullet, uh, PHP unit is a hugely popular project. Um, you know, the simple test module um, was actually started by me, and so I take full responsibility for it, um, but it really has grown in a way that I'm no longer that comfortable with it. Um, it started off as a, um, we used the simple test project, uh, which is a great open source project. Um, 
but since then we've really made it into our own specialized thing, and particularly our own specialized thing that does this host Drupal system under test thing. All right. Um, we made that decision. Um, it, it was, I think, a good decision at the time when we were adding unit tests um, and a testing framework. We really struggled with, is anyone going to pay attention and care you know, to the tests were there that, that we need to write? We need to write thousands of tests. And it was decided that we had to have a web GUI for running tests. It had to ship with Drupal. The runner had to ship with Drupal, the test had to ship with Drupal, and it had to be super easy for developers to see what we were doing in the simple test module. Um, I think you know, everyone would say that's been a huge success. Um, when you run the unit test suite, there's 40,000 assertions or whatever there are. Um, there's just an amazing uh, suite of tests that we've built. Um, but uh, I think that we can now you know, preserve all of those tests and just change the test runner. Um, so that's what PHP unit does, okay? Um, one of the objections that comes up when I talk about Upl is that, hey, this web GUI that you find at admin slash something simple test, um, you know, people use that, people like that, and they're, the way most people use PHP unit is from the command line, all right? Um, there is a visual PHP unit open source project. Uh, this is a screenshot from that. Um, so for folks who want to run unit tests from the GUI, that's still an option, okay? We don't, we can still have GUI unit tests and not ship with our own UI, all right? I think that's much more healthy for us to drop the UI from Drupal, rely on this project, and take advantage of the huge PHP unit ecosystem. So when you um, start using PHP unit as your test runner, you get to take advantage of lots of stuff that's going on in the, in the PHP community. So these are two screenshots from two IDEs uh, that are quite popular. It's NetBeans and Eclipse. I know that the same capabilities are in PHP Storm and Komodo. Um, so you know, by, by taking on PHP unit, we automatically get IDE integration, which is a really a huge step for us, I think. Um, and you know, we should be excited about that. Um, there are, I guess over here, I was saying that when you adopt PHP unit, um, it comes with code coverage calculation, okay? So when you run your tests, you know what lines are being tested and what ones aren't, all right? Um, that's harder to do with our browser-based tests. Um, it's automatic with our unit based test, but in any case, you know, we're further along in code coverage calculation when we adopt PHP unit. Um, things like Jenkins plugins, you know, JUnit XML, that comes for free um, when you adopt PHP unit. All right. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about you, how Upl works. Um, Upl um, basically preserves everything that is in Drupal web test case and Drupal unit test case, all right? So I basically copied all of that code into a new project, Upl project, um, and changed the setup and teardown methods so we don't actually set up a new Drupal site in setup. Um, we just test the Drupal site that the, using the code base that we have right there um, and set up a new, you know, run and install if we have to. All right. Um, the tests that live in all the module directories are completely unchanged, okay? So the idea of Upl right now is that it's a drop-in replacement um, and all of our tests continue to run, all right? Um, and the, the final big win is that we delete the simple test module. You know, if this finally gets into Drupal 8, um, that would be part of the patch, is to remove everything that you find in simple test module, because what that module is about is about the test runner, and we're replacing that with PHP unit. So the web GUI um, goes away. Um, it, you know, it has a bunch of tests to test itself. It's got API. It's got a whole bunch of things. 
we get rid of all of that, okay? Um, so um, that's really the end of the UPL part of the talk, all right? So just to summarize, the idea is to replace the current test runner with PHP unit, all right? Um, I want to talk a little bit about the tests themselves um, and at least start a conversation about where we can go with the tests. Um, there are two really interesting um, PHP projects that we might want to take a look at. Um, one is called Behat and the other one's called Mink. All right, uh, I hope I'm saying Behat right. Anyone say yes or no? All right, let's go with that. Behat, Behat, don't know. Um, Mink is uh, like a, Mink is a browser, essentially a programmatic browser. So it's analogous to the browser that's in Simple Test now, where you tell it go to this URL, click this link, fill out this form field, etc. Um, these are just two projects that are based on Symfony that um, we would have to use. All right, so let's look at what a Bahat test looks like. Um, go to here. All right, <clears throat> so this looks quite different from our current unit tests. Um, the tests are written in completely readable English, okay? Um, so uh, this takes a while to wrap your mind around it, um, but I think it's actually quite a step forward. So this is the blog feature um, this is an excerpt from some tests that we maintain at Acquia for Drupal Commons. We actually use, um, we don't use Bahat, we use this Ruby-based system called Cucumber, which is the same thing but in Ruby, all right? And um, the language that the tests in actually are shared between um, Cucumber and Bahat. So here we're testing the blog feature of Drupal Commons. You can think of this as testing the um, erstwhile blog feature in Drupal 8, okay? Um, we have some setup type stuff that has to happen at the beginning of the test. That's that background section. So, you know, written in English, given a fresh Drupal Commons installation, given a user named Derpington with a password, it's oh my god barbecue, you know, log in and join an organic group, okay? That's the setup for this particular test. Um, and then we actually have the tests themselves, all right? The tests themselves are called scenarios, all right? There can be one or more scenarios in a file like this. This is called a feature file in Bahat, all right? So um, it's a lot like what you're used to when you write tests. They have setup methods, they have a bunch of test methods. Um, it's the same thing here, they're just written in English, okay? I will show you in a minute how the English gets translated into something that a computer can actually do, all right? Um, if we look at the scenario outline, we see that we're gonna create a blog entry with a certain title text and a certain body text. You can see that there's uh, placeholders for title text and body text here. Um, and, um, the test says go ahead and submit that blog entry and then it has some assertions. I should see a blog entry with certain body and title in it, okay? This example section down below is uh, just nicely readable table of data that you're gonna feed into the scenario, all right? So you just loop over the data set and run the scenario twice in this case. Here's the title test text column, here's the body text column, there's two rows, okay? So <clears throat> this is a real test from our test suite. Um, so let's go ahead and look at, um, okay, so stuff, each line in a Bahat based test is called a step, okay? and what you have to do is write some code in order to be able to tell Bahat what the English means and where the function is that does it, okay? 
So here's a bunch of files. Um, there's a directory called step definitions. Um, and if you look at a step definition, this is what one looks like, okay? So this is a step definition for I have joined the default group, all right? We mean an organic group in this case, all right? So this is actually a regular expression up here, and that is how Behat figures out what the English means and where the function is that's supposed to do it, okay? There's not magic here, there's just regular expressions. Um, <clears throat> the good news is that you rare, very rarely have to ever write the regular expression. Bahat actually hands you these, so you write your, your English first, your feature, and then you run it, and Bahat says, oh, you haven't actually created step defi definitions for these. Here is a shell of what you're gonna need. All right, so let me show you how that works. Um, Correct. It's a good clarification. So, you know, for Upol, you don't have to adopt any of this stuff. Um, as a separate part of, you know, I get a chance to talk to great core developers. Here's something I think would be good for the project. All right. So, um, but this is really kind of separate from Upol. And how am I doing on time here? We have 15 people. 15. Good. Um, all right. Well, uh, you know, we've put in our own code here, which is to say visit this URL. So you can see that uh, it's the Mink project that understands what visit means. It means navigate with your programmatic browser to go somewhere um, and click button, all right? So um, go to the terminal. Let's see if we can make this bigger for you guys. Scroll down, way down, okay. So here I am in a um, small project. This is actually, if you go to the Bahat website, they have some great docs and a great quick start guide. So I have, I'm halfway through the quick start guide at this point. Um, I have written my English-based test. Um, and now I'm going to run Bahat for the first time. So I run the command line program called Bahat. It looks at my English um, feature or all the feature files that are in the directory, and this is what it tells me. It says that I have two scenarios defined. I, I, I have declared them, but they're, they're not implemented yet. Um, he doesn't know what any of the step definitions are that are in them, okay? <clears throat> this is actually the feature file that, we're, that we just ran. In order to, so the thing we're testing is the LS program. Um, and there's some background information and two scenarios here um, that are, um, everyone can kind of relate to, that uh, <clears throat> it tests that the LS actually enumerates all the files in the directory, okay? So here are all the step definitions that need to be defined, all right? And what I wanted to really show you was that Bahat will just give you these regular expressions right here and shell functions that you paste into your file and you just start replacing um, with a little bit of code where it says throw new p pending exception. That's where you actually implement your step definition, okay? Um, So if we look, at what like a, a larger test suite would look like with Bahat, this is the um, Drupal Commons test suite that Acquia maintains. Um, you will see some Ruby in here. Clearly the Drupal project would write in PHP, not in Ruby, but all the principles remain. Um, it's a bunch of features all these files over here, those are dot feature files. Um, that's where your tests are written, your English-based test. A directory of step definitions, okay? And um, some support files that are kind of shared code that you might need within your tests. That's really all there is to it. 
Um, the Bahat command line program does a really good job of um, giving you enumerations of all your step definitions. So you can, as a test author, you can kind of see what English act, a, actions are available to you. Um, so you figure out how to write, I need a new user, I need a user that's logged in, and then you can kind of go through with your test. Um, so the reason for this, um, so you know, you, some people have an initial objection to Bahat and Cucumber because there's a layer of indirection there between the English and the code. Um, and extra layers are bad. Um, I'm you know, fully in agreement there. But I think that the benefits you get are um, more important than the indirection. All right? The benefits you get are that um, anyone in the community can spec out a new feature. Okay? The way they spec out a new feature is to write that English-based test. That is a very clear way that anyone can say, this is what a activity stream should look like in Drupal core. And once it passes all of these tests, you have a very clear agreement that it does what the requirements were set out. Um, maintaining these tests is going to be a lot easier. A lot of that work can be done by anyone because they're written in English. Bahat actually supports other languages, but I think we'd probably write our um, tests in English. Um, and, uh, and so I think it's just more inclusive to have testing opened up to um, all these other people. Yes, we'll still need developers to implement step definitions and change them from time to time, um, but I'm pretty excited about opening up the, the simple tests and the testing community bigger. All right, so um, that's it for my pitch about Yupul and Bahat. I guess we have some time for conversation here, then we're going to start media. All right, five minutes for conversation. Great. Um, go up to the microphone, please. So with this approach, uh, are you proposing that any new features for Drupal core start with writing a test first before writing code? Um, so I, I don't think that there's really a way to enforce that. Mm -hmm. um, whenever code usually shows up for Drupal in the issue queue as a patch, the patch will have a test uh, and it will have the functionality. So it's never quite clear if the person did test-driven development or not. In, in fact, it does not matter. Um, so I'd say whatever people find comfortable, they can do it that way. Okay. And on the, the topic of sort of twice as much in terms of the English version and then all the actual steps, uh, if we count comments as lines of code, we might, we might not have double the amount of code because I think for just about every test, there's an English comment explaining what it does. And this seems like that just split apart mm. slightly differently. That's a great way to think of it. I hadn't thought of it that way. That's awesome. Hi. Um, so taking a step back to the architecture of Yupo, um, being the author of the uh, deploy module, we're actually um, using the current um, simple test setup in a very interesting way because we're setting up actually two sites mm -hmm. um, communicating with each other, deploying content between them. There's a lot of uh, black magic with sort of headers and things like that in requests between them. Would there be any way in Yupol to actually you know, set up two sites to test them, communicate with them? Because uh, now it's only one site that is, that is running it. Uh, yeah, true. I, but I think that in your test, you could set up an additional one. You basically would do another multi-site with the same code base. OK. Yeah. Um, so and do a, do a setup of Drupal. Yeah. OK, cool. Awesome. Yeah. Very excited about the uh, concept of, of using a Cucumber-like uh, test framework. I was actually really curious, too, if there's any uh, maybe tangible examples from perhaps Acquia or maybe another organization that uses uh, probably like an Agile or Scrum method to generate those stories, uh, particularly from a managerial standpoint. Because it seems like if you have that, the tight coupling you're trying to do in the Drupal organization is clearly a tight coupling that's practiced elsewhere. And I imagine that um, there's probably something we could learn from there. Um, 
I, I know that there are other organizations using um, behavior-driven development. That's what that's kind of the category that we're talking about, BDD. Um, I know that uh, Damien from Commerce Guys is really big on Bahat and Mink and thinks that's a great direction for us. So maybe Commerce Guys is using it. I'm not quite sure, you know, who's who's using it. But uh, you know, the idea definitely is that um, Simple Test is hard to use outside of Drupal core development. Um, I think we can really, you know, make our our test suite much more useful for our own client projects and so forth. It's definitely a goal. Yeah, I had a question on Bahat. So I've kind of seen projects like this before. The problem I've seen happen is that all like the kind of permutations you can do of steps and like the all the permutations that the underlying code actually supports is different. So I wonder if you kind of had any insight on that. Cause the problem, can you say it one more time? It's just you think, okay, I just need to, to like do this test case, I just need to take these pre-existing steps and then ah. just like kind of create like a new permutation, but then you find, oh, when I put these steps in this order, now like there's something, a bug in the underlying code, and maybe those other permutations that worked, but now you do a different permutation, you think, oh, I have to change the steps, and then all of a sudden you realize back, said, oops, I have to change the code, or oh, the code supports these steps in this order, but not in that order. Right, I mean, I think that uh, you know steps are shared code, you know across the whole project, and so anytime you have shared code, you have to treat it gently and treat it with love, and you know it's very much about um, making these steps generic so they can service as many test scenarios as possible. Um, we have the same sort of thing now in um, Drupal Web Testcase.php. We have create node and Drupal login and log out. That's all shared code that we maintain and you know, we have to change it carefully. So I think it's the same sort of problem that we've been dealing with is what you're describing. I was curious if you put any thought into uh, how, how we would manage the mapping of the steps to the natural language and avoid the uh, kind of duplication of the steps in, in the drupal.org infrastructure. And my second question was more like, I, I do the LDAP module and I have to make a lot of fake server code. And I was wondering if the PHP unit project, if it had in that project, if there was a lot of mock servers that were being uh, generated for different outside externalities. Sure, yeah, great question. Um, the, the second part first, um, PHP unit has mock objects, um, and you know we will definitely start using those. Simple test doesn't have that, so you know this is the kinds of things you get for free when you go with the leading test runner. Um, it has a terrific manual with lots of examples and comments, so it's quite easy to get started with that. The it, you know for people who want to get more experience with PHP unit, there's also um, the Drush unit tests are all built on PHP unit. And so people who love Drush can start helping out there. Um, the first part of your question was harder. What was it about? With the, with the mapping of the natural language yeah. to the steps, right. how, do you, how do you avoid the uh, duplication of the steps? Um, I, you know, I think it's similar to the last question of like, it's shared code. It's, you know, people have to be aware of all the step definitions that are available to them. They need to try to not duplicate when there's a slight variance from what's there. Um, we, we're pretty good at coding standards. We will need sort of English standards for how we write these steps. Um, I think this is the sort of stuff that we do and we're pretty good at. Um, so I, that's all for my time, but I wanna keep going with this conversation, so please um, find me and talk amongst yourselves and let's get a little momentum for this stuff for Drupal 8. Here. We're good? Okay. Hi there, everyone. My name is Dave Reed, and I am a senior engineer at Palantir.net, and fairly recently become one of the co-maintainers of the media module for Drupal, and kind of gotten myself into a nice, big, nasty mess with that, too. Um, so this is just kind of my core conversation on kind of what we've been doing, because we've, we've done something kind of unofficial. Um, kind of just let you know about that and also kind of show what the things we want to do to improve media handling in Drupal 8 and kind of what my, my idea and we'll see how it fits with your idea or if you just like it. Um, 
So we have this unofficial, official media initiative. Um, we decided we wanted to do this as media maintainers uh, last September, uh, as just kind of a uh, imitation of the core initiative model. We wanted to promote uh, and kind of form our own group around the media module and contrib and all of the modules that implement with it too, and kind of help support and provide, you know, help uh, and grief support for people that have been working with it. Um, so, of course, one of the things we did first is we have a now kind of official roadmap for the module, which we didn't really have before, uh, which kind of helps get people involved and, you know, because they can see, oh, what's being worked on, uh, maybe I can help contribute to that. Uh, and, of course, this is a community roadmap, too. It's not like Acquia is deciding this. It's not like Palantir is deciding this. This is a community agreed on roadmap. Um, and I'm kind of like the, if, the unofficial official lead of this initiative, and I'm kind of taking a benevolent decider role. Um, but I'm not trying to push my own agenda with this. So it's a community roadmap. Uh, we also now have a bug squad going uh, with Thomas Svensson, who's here, um, which is awesome. The, that model was started by views because we totally needed it for media, too. Um, and it's already really started to help. I would encourage it if you have a big module, too. Um, so it's, it's, it's a good way to get new people involved as well with the module. Um, like the core initiatives, we're also having biweekly meetings in IRC. Uh, they're on Thursdays about 2 p.m. Central Time, or 3 p.m. Central Time. Uh, we post on our groups page when they are, and I would encourage you to join. Uh, and like I said, it's just those meetings are also to help encourage new contributors, decide on a roadmap, talk about what we're working on, that kind of thing. Um, and this initiative is also kind of our commitment as maintainers of the module that, yes, we're going to be here, we're going to listen to issues, um, we're going to be responsive and not kind of try and disappear on you. And it's also kind of a good commitment for the community, too, because um, that way they're not going to be like, well, is Palantir going to like stop working with media and abandon it and no one's going to be working on it anymore? Should I keep using media? Um, so it's kind of our way of saying, yes, this is a community-led project. It's going to continue. We want to have momentum into it. Um, but so one of the things we were starting to do kind of now that Dries has announced a feature freeze for Drupal 8 uh, is we kind of need to start looking at core and how we can, you know, do we want to move media into core? What's kind of the plan with that and what we can do? Um, so to first, we need to cover some bad assumptions that Core has with media management and files. And I, I'm sorry that I'm going to have to bring these up, but I hate them. Um, Core has some bad assumptions that files are always local and writable. Um, if you have a read-only file stream, you can't do image style derivatives of them. Um, because it's hard coded that you have to be able to write to that image style, to that stream wrapper. I can't have a um, remote just loading from HTTP and say, I want to put my image derivatives in the public file system. It's, it's difficult. Um, the concept of file extensions does not apply to remote files. In a file field, you have that little field of allowed file extensions. What do you put there if someone wants to put a YouTube video? or a Vimeo. You can't. Uh, so we're trying to work with this concept of mime types in media. So we have a mime type of video slash YouTube. Um, but it's kind of hard because we have to also deal with this assumption that we're working with file extensions in core. And we don't really have a good solution on how to resolve that yet. And my favorite function, file delete. Oh, God, it's my favorite function in the world. Um, because I, I've got some code for it later. Um, it doesn't actually delete a file. It does validation twice, three times. It, has to, it checks to see if the file has a valid uh, URI. It checks to see if the file is used anywhere. And it checks to see if file unmanaged delete actually succeeded. And if either of those cases fail, the file it fails. I can't just call file delete. It's really frustrating. Um, another really big assumption is that files will never be reused. And this is killer for media. Um, we have a file usage system in core that if you upload a file and put it on a node, and then you remove that file and save your node, that file gets deleted. And you can no longer reuse it. You have to re-upload it. 
and just sucks for a media library concept. Um, and I've looked at other systems too. WordPress does not care at all. It'll just leave all those files in there for you because it has a media library. And it's just, it's really frustrating to deal with this file usage system. Um, and another fun one is image dimensions. There was an issue put into Drupal 7 core that we wanted to include in image dimensions when you output an image. That data is attached to field data. So if you reuse that image twice, you've now made that, those image dimensions redundant. You're storing them in two different places now. And we could just store them related to the file ID, but we didn't. And I'm kicking myself that I didn't like, I actually did propose an issue. I was like, why don't we just associate it with the file record? And I, I kind of got ignored and I didn't push on it. And I'm kicking myself. And it's just, ugh, we're just duplicating data that we could reuse because this is causing a performance issue now in media. Um, and the fun thing is that the file usage system assumes that it's always accurate and correct, but it doesn't handle revisions in core. So if you add a file in one revision and then remove it and switch it to a different file, again, that first file gets deleted. You can't revert to that old revision and keep the file. It's gone. Sucks. Um, and we also have the concept of media that puts uh, files, you, uh, we embed it via WYSIWYG. And we have to make sure that we are tracking it and it's really fun code to like parse the text value of the text field, searching for and regexing for our file ID string and then have to add it to the filter usage system. It's fun. Uh, and there's also kind of a weird thing with image field. It's kind of a special case of file field. Um, and we've had to have deal with some assumptions because it includes different field data like the dimensions and alternate text. Uh, and how would we support that in media because we changed the widget completely. Uh, so here, let's go to some easy wins for Drupal 7 or Drupal 8. Um, we can do these. These are really fairly simple in the grand scheme of things. Um, and you can actually find like these issues because they're tagged with media initiative in the core queue. Um, so the first thing is that we're converting our entities to f actual classes in Drupal 8 and we're kind of stuck a little bit with the file entity. So we need help porting that to a real class and there's an issue for that. Um, fix file delete to do what it actually should do. Um, Cause yeah, here's, this is like in file delete. Why are we doing this? We should not care if it's a valid URI. We don't care. And then it has, you know, it checks usage. And if that file unmanaged delete function fails, we return false. It's just uh, frustrating. And we need to also stop storing the file entity object in the field data. So when you have a file field and you reference a file, in the node object, for like a, a node reference field, you just see a node ID in the node object. If you, for a node reference field or a user reference field, you just have a user ID that's stored in the node. For a file or image field, you get the whole damn file and image entity stored in there. So if you change something on that file entity, that node that's been cached is now invalid. It's frustrating. Um, and one thing that would be nice is we could add a kind of a base remote stream wrapper uh, for read-only stuff so that it'd be easy, easy for other people to extend. Core only includes a local stream wrapper, but it'd be nice to have a remote one too because it's just, it'd be easier to extend that way. Um, and along with that, we want to make sure that we want to have uh, uh, image styles to be controlled based on the scheme that's being used. So we could have an Amazon stream wrapper say, I want to store my image styles uh, on my Amazon system. Or a HTTP stream wrapper says, I want to store my image styles in the public file system because I can't really go and save it onto someone else's website. It's just not going to work. So that's just kind of an easy win. Uh, and another one that would just be really nice to have for core and would be really great is to be able to support HTML5 audio and video tags. That'd be a huge win because we work for images, but you want to do audio or video. Okay, you have to install two different modules. Um, so we've got some all, like different solutions. We've got Media Element uh, to consider as an external library that could do that. Uh, Popcorn.js, uh, which I just learned about like an hour ago, uh, could possibly do that. And Travis uh, Tidwell has been working on uh, Media Element. He, he told me about that one. Um, so that would be a nice easy win too. 
Um, so here we get the not easy stuff. This stuff is not, oof. Hmm. Um, so the one thing we'd really like to do is make files fieldable in core. And basically right now, what we're doing in contrib is we have this module called file entity that it's its own separate project now that basically enables you to put fields on files. It gives you a whole UI for administering a list of all the files that have been uploaded on your site. So just like the content screen, you can see them all. It'll show the file type. You can hit edit or delete. Um, you can edit the fields on those on an individual file. You have file types where you can add the fields and manage their display. It's a lot of work, and it's kind of an odd concept. Um, and we want to. It'd be one of the things we need to put into core, um, because the concept of having fields on files is what we want. Um, but we also have a lot of work to do in the file entity module still. Um, it's not quite finished yet. Um, it doesn't have a lot of tests. It doesn't have any tests, uh, which is bad. Um, and we also need a usability review, which we're working on. Um, but like configuring the way that different file types are displayed is really, really, really hard for users. Um, and we also, currently in the module, there's different file types. So there's application, audio, image, video, uh, which are currently tied to the common MIME types, the first part of the MIME type. Um, but probably we're going to want users that should be able to define their own file types. So like a document file type for PDFs and Microsoft Office and those types of files. They should be able to edit those, and currently you can't. So we need to figure that how that works. Uh, and we also want to put in a file access API, uh, which would be really nice because it would replace like hook file download and stuff. So you could actually just call file access operation file object and the account for which it's going to happen. It makes more sense than what's going on in core right now. It'd be nice if we had an ent entity access API in core for Drupal 8. I'm not sure if it's going to happen or not, but we're proceeding with what works for us right now. So, And we also need to resolve what's the difference between field data and the stuff that's in the fields themselves, like alternate text on image fields. Should that be data on the field, or should that be a, a field on the file? And it's, of course, like a tongue twister and massively confusing. I don't know what's right. What's right? Maybe we'll talk about it after. Um, and the last part is we you know, eventually want to put the media browser into core, you know, the whole UI aspect. But there's going to be a few things that I want to do first. Uh, it needs usability testing. And again, we're working on this. We're getting some Acquia usability engineers involved, and we're doing some formal testing soon. Uh, we're getting it going, because it's just it's still a little confusing. doesn't work quite the way people expect. Um, we have a ways to go. Um, and we do have file and image fields in core right now, so it's not like there is a massive gaping hole in core media management that we need to rush our work in. I, I like to take the approach of get it right in contrib and then move it into core. Uh, Angie's gonna differ with me on that. She's just gonna be like, we want it in now. We can refine it, and I don't like that method. So we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, we need views. Uh, we went through a big transition in the media browser because we had all this custom code written for listing and displaying all the files. And you couldn't filter it. You couldn't change it. And we put in a big conversion to views for this. And I don't want to regress if we put it into core. So we need views. And that's kind of a big issue. Uh, and we also need a good modal API in core. Um, because currently, our modal is pretty hard coded. It has lots of bad assumptions. Uh, it's, not, it's not the most easy to understand JavaScript. It has some bugs that edge cases. It's just it's nice to be, able to, to be able to reuse what core has. And there's not really anything right now. But. And a few things that would be nice to have. Uh, it'd be nice to have an entity reference field in core. Uh, and it would get rid of the use of file or image fields and kind of deprecate them. And it'd also be nice to have a way to like select existing things for this entity reference. Because what we're doing with the media browser and being able to select existing things is not unique. I mean, node reference wants that too. User reference wants that too. Like, we don't want to be solving this for our own selves. We want to have a solution that's good for other people to use. But you know, we also maybe need just a media browser because it has a special case. So. Um, another thing that would be nice is if we could, if you have an entity reference field, 
Uh, so say you're embedding, you're referencing a node, but you want to change the title for when that node is linked on another node. You can't really do that. And that's kind of what we're doing with image fields right now in alternate text. We're just, you're referencing a file and changing the way the alternate text is displayed. Um, so maybe this kind of concept would be useful for core too and nice to have. So the, I mean, the overall theme is we're not like completely ready yet. We're, I'm gonna be the first to admit that there's a lot of downfalls for media right now. Sure, it's really great for you know, a majority use case, but once you start getting into it, it takes a lot of work. It starts to become unusable and gets really frustrating. And so we'd really like to take, you know, get more polish and contrib, um, but still kind of work on those easy wins for now. Those are definitely things that we're targeting now for Drupal 8, and we know that we can do. Um, so, I mean, we're having a sprint planning boff uh, this afternoon, and we're going to be having a full day sprint on Friday, so if anyone is interested in helping with media, uh, definitely come talk to me, come to the BOF, come on Friday, because uh, we're probably gonna be working on those easy win issues, um, and hopefully get a lot of patches generated for those. Um, and that's really all I have. So now I'd just really love to hear from you, questions, uh, concerns, what you'd like to see. So. Hi, um, I was just wondering, um, if you have a, a media browser, um, would it be better to be listing the the file entities that are in the database rather than looking on disk. That's what so it's doing right it now. Yeah, okay. Yep. Thanks. Um, first, uh, two quick questions. Um, if I magically applied all the magic patches to Media 2, could I use it now? Yes, it's totally usable right now. Okay. Um, so the, the secret is that I'm actually using Media 2X. It's in unstable right now. Um, in contrib, but I'm actually using it on several production sites and several other people are too. So I'm kind of on the hook if something bad goes wrong <laughs> and I will fix it right away. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty safe to use. You just, I want to stress that you need to have engineers to support it in case something goes wrong. Okay. Uh, you just can't have the assumption that you can use it and go. The second question is, um, as someone who's trying to work on cleaning up the CSS and JavaScript with the overlay module, mm -hmm. Could you just send me a list of everything you want done <laughs> to make it the awesome modal you, you have always dreamed of? Well, I mean, that's kind of actually something that I'm a little concerned about because most of the time the node form is opened in overlay. We want an overlay on top of overlay. I mean, I have a module that does that. It's called Inception. Um, but it's not, it's, it's, it's a joke. So we, we need something that we need a way to be able to do that modal media browser window on top of overlay as well. So that's kind of what I'm talking about there. So I, I've, I want to use overlay, but I don't think it's going to be able to, to use that. Yes. So I'm, I'm probably to blame for the bio usage stuff, but I kind of think you're misunderstanding okay. the way that it's supposed to work. Um, I mean, a lot of the overhead and file delete is there because um, think about how it fails, right? If you can't actually delete the file and it's like a two gig file, do you really want that hanging out on the on the disk if it's not in the database? I mean, there's 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 kind of a lot of reasons for some of that. They're not always great. Um, and then as far as the usage stuff, I mean, the way the idea with the usage was that it you could you could write a media library module that just stuck usage on everything so that it doesn't actually get deleted, and then you could you know kind of develop your criteria for which ones go into that media browser. But then you know they could be held onto, and then you don't have to worry about some contrib module deleting the file out from under you. So I. I think some of the stuff is there, it's just figuring out how to get it, get it right. Yeah, with file delete, I, uh, talking about if what if an actual file delete operation failed, you wouldn't want to remove it from the database. Um, and I say, I, I wish it would throw exceptions like node save does, or node delete does um, instead, because we could handle it then. Um, and for file usage, there's actually a module that does that right now, it's called file lock. And it basically automatically adds just an empty usage uh, for automatically for every file or for every pattern of a file name or that kind of thing. Um, I'd rather just get rid of the usage system and make it optional in, and like move it to contrib because I'd just rather not care. Because if we have an AP, a UI for deleting files, users can do it themselves. Right, well I think once files are actually like a proper entity, but like that was one of the things where it, we didn't have any kind of a management system mm -hmm. that was presented to the user, so 
you know, like, yeah, how, how do you ensure that it sticks around long enough but can get cleaned up? And so. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's tough because, I mean, it's the assumptions that files can't be used in Drupal 7 because there was no way to reuse them. And so we did what we did. And it's, it's just kind of a struggle to work against that in media in contrib since we can't really change the way Drupal 7 works. But, yeah. Should image module just be merged into file module? I don't know for sure. Um, I mean, there's a valid use case for image module being different from file, since it does have like the alternate text part of the uh, field widget, mm -hmm. and um, it has its own formatter for displaying image fields with an image style. Um, but if we figure out, you know, if we have the image file type mm -hmm. and manage the display of that, that kind of takes care of that. Okay. Um, so I, I'm not completely sure. I'm, I'm open to input on what people think of why we have two different file reference fields in core. Mm -hmm. So. And should files be revisionable? That's a very good question too, because they probably should. Um, yeah. But it's hard to support right now. Mm -hmm. And if files are revisionable, and the file is an, an image and you revision it and it's a new version of the image, is that old image file still there? Uh, what happens to the, the URLs if there are? Um, yeah, because that's an yeah. interesting problem because the file manage table, uh, the, uh, the URI column is unique. Um, so you, I don't know how we'd work that out. I mean, definitely we want a use case for revisionable files and be able to store mm -hmm. all that old data. Um, but yeah, it's a tough issue. <laughs> okay, thanks. Where is accessibility on your roadmap? Accessibility is we will definitely prioritize any issue that comes up. Um, I just think it's a matter of we need people that know what we're looking for. Um, if, if there's guidelines out there with things we should be looking for, we definitely want to review those. Um, it, it's kind of like usability in the same area that we, will, we know that probably there's something wrong. We don't really know what's wrong um, and don't really have the time or capacity to like do a whole lot of research into it, but we're totally open to people saying, hey, here's what's wrong. Here's, here's how we can fix it. All so. title tags immediately yep. come to mind, but there's other things like ARIA inclusion uh, for uh, higher education, governmental institutions, it's a very big deal. Mm -hmm. So we can't actually at the U uh, use it right now because of those issues. Got it, okay. Definitely talk to me later if you want to. Yeah, no, I'm coming to the sprint. So. Good, all right. Um, I, was, I was wondering if uh, an entity reference should be able to, to have a formatter. So if, if we have a, an entity reference to a, a, fi a file entity, so it, if that's an image, then we want to have the formatter it, or the, the form or the display to display it one way. If it's a video, it has to be different. But what do you think about that? Well, that's kind of how the, the file types work right now. Because um, uh, you configure like you configure your image file type and your default view mode for that file type to use an image style. Uh, or you can use you know, any other different image. In the video, like you can set it to configure, uh, to use media element first. And uh, you can also use a YouTube. Like, it's a little bit weird, the manage file display tab for media, because you can have multiple formatters. And it's like, the first one, it tries. If that's applicable to the current file, it uses that. If not, it falls down, it falls down, it falls down, it falls down. Um, and that's a little wonky. Um, so that's like one of the usability concerns we have is that people have a hard time configuring that. Um, but like once you have it set, it works just fine. Mm -hmm. So, so if, if we use the, the entity reference field, um, would we need to improve that so it, it can display um, different forms? It's, I, don't think, I don't think it does that at the moment. Well, I think entity reference allows you to use just like a rendered formatter, which you select okay. a view mode, so it just worked with that, so. Cool. Yep. I, I think I may be sort of missing something. Uh, currently, the way that it works uh, with managed files is they are more or less treated as sort of a static entity. Mm -hmm. And I don't really see a big disadvantage in that simply because usually when you are referring to something is from a user's point of view, they're referring to it from the point of view of a, of a node, which essentially refers to a file in a file field 
or uh, filed entity, I guess. And rather than trying to add revision information at the managed file level, why not simply ask users to refer to a different file that is a constant? So if they want to upload a new version of a file, they're creating a new file entity, and the old one can still be left around for your library, uh, but they're simply referring to the new one instead, and that gets revisioned as part of the node itself. Yeah, and I mean, that could be a way we do original files. Um, and I've heard both cases where people want to actually change the existing file and replace it's just the file data, but keep all the fields for it, um, which is something that would be a little bit of a concern because you'd have to copy the field data over right. to the new one. You'd, it'd be like a clone, basically, uh, operation. I would see it more as being, uh, you know, a file upload is static and never changes, and all the metadata associated with it. Granted, you know, we probably should be adding more metadata. Uh, you know, for videos, you'd want to have the width and height and so forth that mm -hmm. are associated with it. But if you take that model, then you're taking revisioning out of con out of the control at that lowest level of the f of the f uh, of the managed file mm -hmm. and putting it back at the node level, which is where I think it really kind of should be. Yeah, I mean, we have two different proposals. I I don't think we have a right decision on which one's okay. what we should use, and that's definitely something we'll have to discuss. Yeah. Yep. And update it in this node, but I want to switch it out for another file. All of the other nodes that are, that are pointing to the original uh, aren't aware of this new operation. Yep, that's definitely a good point. So, so by treating them as you know, a first class entity, effectively, as we should be doing in the original process, um, you know, being able to revision them just makes it easier to say, you know, now it's a different shade of blue across the entire site. Yep, that's a good counterpoint to that, so, okay. yep, all right. I was interested in your uh, comment about uh, managing, uh, getting it right in contrib versus uh, developing as a candidate for core. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think one approach versus the other is more likely to succeed in getting it into Drupal 8? And what happens if, uh, I, I think it's a great initiative and very important, uh, what happens if it doesn't make it into Drupal 8? Um, I mean, it kind of depends on how much official support there is behind it. Uh, so right now we're kind of in unofficial status. Um, but I know that Dries and Angie and the Drupal 8 uh, maintainers do want improved file management. Um, it's just going to be a matter of making sure that our stuff is ready, uh, reviewed enough. Um, and it's just that's why kind of we have the initiative is to get more people involved so we can have our own momentum behind it and keep it up and make sure we can, you know, maybe get these things accomplished by December. And do you think, uh, what about whether one approach versus the other is more likely to succeed? I think they're both at this point, honestly. I mean, we haven't, initiatives are still kind of new um, to us. And, you know, things are getting in with HTML5 and things that are not related to initiative are getting in just fine too. Um, so I, I don't really have, which one works better. Um, I just personally like the theory of getting things right or close to right in Contrib first and then just trying to move it in. Uh, so I, I think they're both valid methods. So not really an answer, but. Yep, one more. So on the, the, another kind of data point on the um, file revisions um, back in the, the audio module, um, it had sort of a quirk where uh, as you'd put in the metadata in the form, it would write it back to the ID3 tags. So I had kind of set up a thing where it did support, like revisions of the node would result in revisions of the file, mm -hmm. um, which, I mean, if you had, you know, podcast, you had a bunch of 60 meg files every time you made a revision, which is kind of painful, but um, the, the way that that was sort of usable was that it had its own uh, play and download callbacks, so it could kind of redirect it to the right version, so you could actually have it play the right file since it was kind of obscuring the URL and not using the, the you know, file name mm -hmm. as part of the URL. Yeah. All right. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I definitely love to see you at the Media Boff and the Media Sprint. So.